You're listening to Blue Jays Nation Radio with Cam Lewis and Tyler Uremchuk, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Episode 199 of Blue Jays Nation Radio, another spring training edition of the pod. And as always, it is brought to you by our friends over at Botano MLB Futures. Everything you need for opening day, you can get it at Botano.ca. 19 plus, please play responsibly. Your Emcha Coombsy and a special guest today on the pod is Andrew Stoughton swinging by for today's episode. Andrew, how's it going? It's going great, man. Uh, good to be here. Yeah, excited to have you on and excited to have Blue Jays Happy Hour as a part of the Jays Nation this year. Tell us a little bit about the show, what people can expect. Uh, I mean, if people don't know us, it's uh, it's me and Nick Ashbourne, who uh, who you'll see him uh, all over the place at Sportsnet. Uh, he was at Yahoo before, uh, doing stuff, uh, uh, doing great things. Nick, uh, we just chat Blue Jays. It's basically, uh, you know, the tried and true podcast format. You all know it. You'd love it. Uh, it's just our little uh, uh, corner of things. And yeah, really excited about uh, uh, being part of the network. Uh, it's going to be a fun year. Yeah, excited to have you around and also excited for real baseball to start for the Toronto Blue Jays. Are you at the same point as everyone else where watching these spring training games is a little bit like pulling teeth? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've not been super active in writing about, you know, the the nitty gritty, the, the, the details of uh, what's been going on the last few weeks. I mean, they're obviously big picture things I probably should be covering a little bit more. But um, yeah, it's the same thing every year. It's like you get really excited. You see that green field on, on mid-February. You're like, oh boy, pitchers and catchers are here. This is great, and you forget that it's like a slog by this point. Like, and it, it, it we're there, and uh, and also this year, you know, it's like, you know, all you want is like guys to not get hurt, and uh, that hasn't quite been the case for the Jays either. Yeah, that has definitely not been the case. The bullpen, the latest area to get hit for uh, for the Blue Jays, and this is one I'll throw I'll throw your, your way in a second too, Coomzy. But we heard Mark Shapiro the other day kind of come out and say you know, it was like the core of this offseason. It was because we believed in our guys. That's why we approached it the way we did. And I'm paraphrasing a bit. Do you buy that at all, or is that just like a bullshitty kind of excuse for having a quiet winter is like, Oh no, it was always the plan. We just believed in our team a lot. Oh, sorry. Coomzy, what do you think? Oh, it was for me. I thought it was for Stoughton. My bad. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, <laughs> I'm, I've, like, oh, I'm, not, I'm not used to there being more than one of us in this thing. I'm used to just like this <laughs> being lobbed up, but yeah, I know I've said this, the same thing a, a few times. And I mean, like, I, I do believe their pursuit of Shoei Otani was authentic. They were ready to hand him that contract, the one he did sign with the Dodgers. And I think if he didn't sign that contract with LA, I think he would have signed it in Toronto. And I mean, we all sort of just told ourselves because they were interested in Otani that subsequently they were also interested in, Juan Soto and you know Yamamoto different guys like that it was kind of Blue Jays fans sort of telling themselves what they wanted and because the Otani thing didn't happen the expectations were just so sky high but I mean there are a lot of interesting pieces within this roster I think that it's just kind of a Toronto Blue Jays fan you can kind of attach this all across fans across Canada like the hockey mode, fans have a hard-on for transactions, fans have a hard-on for additions, trades, and when you go into an offseason and you come out of it with largely the same team, then people just don't get excited about it. Like, There's so much of Blue Jays fandom that contingues, contingues around like who the new thing is, the new guy is, and if you're trying to sell people on, hey, look, there was this half dozen group of guys in AAA who performed well this season and they're going to come up and we think they're going to take a step. We're going to have this depth, like kind of the Tampa Bay Rays model, like the depth is what carries them to their success. I don't think most fans are going to get excited about that, but that doesn't necessarily matter. Like maybe the most exciting baseball team isn't necessarily the best baseball team. Maybe this is just going to be a different version of the day of the Jays with different expectations. And maybe that's just fine. Yeah, and I know he had the line about a lot of people think off seasons won and lost by sensationalism and all of that, which is fair. And it's also interesting when you look at kind of how the fan base is vibing right now. There's not a lot of excitement for this team heading into the year. But when you look at the models, you look at projections, a lot of them, I guess, understandably have the Jays kind of in the same spot that they were a year ago. Andrew, what do you make of that quote from Shapiro? Is he just covering up for some swings and misses that happened during the winter? Or do you believe it's authentic that they went into this offseason, Otani aside, being like, we like our group? 
Uh, I think, I mean, I think they like the group more than, than a lot of the fans do. And I think they understand that some of the performance issues last year were, were well, kind of like luck related and probably, you know, they talk about the preparation and, and I think we all watched them sort of, uh, the game planning maybe didn't, uh, didn't translate as well as we would hope, even though that's sort of a hard thing to glean from, a from your television. Um, I, you know, I, I, I can't imagine that he actually thinks that that, that, that this was a, as good a, an off season as it could have been. Uh, you know, the, the, not a lot of sizzle with, uh, kind of Fluffa and, and Justin Turner, even though Turner is fine, but like he's now making more money than JD Martinez, who was, uh, uh, at a much better year, though. I think there are some, uh, some reasons to uh, uh, turn to play with a foot injury at the end of last year, kind of t- tank his numbers a little bit. So maybe there's more hope there. Um, like, I think I like, a lot of people kind of didn't we lost sight of the fact that, you know, the payroll was really, really high last year, like places where they'd never gone. But asking them to do a lot more um, felt like, I mean, especially after the whole Otani thing, felt like it should be possible, but maybe it wasn't as possible as uh, as everybody expected. And then just the market just wasn't there. Like there weren't that many game changing guys uh, who could come in and really fit this roster and fit like the, the holes that it had. Um, which is not to make an excuse for them because, yeah, it looks yeah, like you say the projections have them about the same place. I think they're a little bit lower, and I think a lot of them have them as kind of a coin flip team to get into the playoffs, which um, is not what you want. I think this team has been, has been projected to win the division the last couple of years and just sort of, sort of has fallen short of the expectations there. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. And I think if the pro- projections had been better, Shapiro this week would have been you know pointing to that because he's been a guy in the past who is, is happy to talk about, you know, objective measures and, you know, look at where they rank our farm system. He doesn't mention that anymore uh, and stuff like that. You know, uh, when those are when those are good for them, then he can point to those. But uh, he has been sort of conspicuous in not doing so this week. So sticking along the lines of, you know, they're banking on some internal improvements this year, specifically with the bats. Are there any players through the spring, Andrew, who are who are exciting you in that measure? Any guys coming back? Or you're like, actually, this uh, a bounce back is realistic, not just the front office grasping at something. Yeah, I think the spring's been pretty exciting in that respect. You know, I think George Springer's looked good. Alejandro Kirk's looked like a lot better. Uh, Vladdy, everything, you know, everything's always there for him. And, and it's just, I think, a matter of hopefully staying healthier, uh, which was probably the bigger problem last year than, uh, than I think a lot of people realized. And, you know, like the, the stuff about the runners in scoring position, which kind of turned around a bit in the last, you know, the second half of last year, the last couple of months, uh, probably talked about a little too much, but and, and probably is a little more luck based. But uh, but yeah, I think that's something that the, the Jays, you know, we talked about this, the trade deadline, right? That was a big the co- topic of conversation was that the, uh, uh, the Jays sort of stuck with their group and believed in their group and believed that, you know, that stuff would come and would change. And it kind of did. Uh, even though you know the way the way the playoffs went, nobody was surprised by, um, and they just sort of went out with a whimper like they had, you know, like every other game that they played this season. It felt like um, so asking people to expect that to still change, I think, is is a tough ask, but I think it's also logical. And yeah, I think there's guys around the lineup who who look like they are poised. Dalton Varsh has had a great spring. Like it's been it's been really pretty good, honestly, uh, for as little as you can you know put into spring numbers. Yeah, I think Varsho is the one that stands out for me just because he's the one guy, if he were to hit his ceiling or even get relatively close to it, that'd be such an impactful guy to slide right behind of Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Kumsi, who stands out for you in that regard in terms of guys having solid springs? You're muted, Kumsi. I keep muting myself because I'm drinking my water bottle and I don't want to make noise when somebody else is talking, but then I keep forgetting to unmute myself. But yeah, there's been a handful of guys like vladdy has been drilling the ball all over the place, seeing Alejandro Kirk hit for power. Ernie Clement's been a really interesting one for me because he kind of just became like the, I, I don't know if I'd, I'd call it this, but maybe like the main character of spring training in a sense, like Blue Jays Twitter really kind of latched onto him. He put up like spectacular results in AAA Buffalo last year played a handful of games with the Blue Jays and did really well. I mean, great bat to ball skills, great contact. He like never strikes out. And then I guess we'll probably get to this later, but I mean, it's his kind of play last year and then into spring training that ultimately made the Blue Jays comfortable making that trade they made yesterday. Santiago Espinal goes to the Cincinnati Reds in exchange for a pitcher and that frees up the 40 man roster spot. But I think it was Ernie Clement, just how good he was last year, how good he's been in spring training. He looks like I don't think I'm going to go ahead and say that because he's had this spring that he looks like some sort of everyday player. I I think that would be a bit of a stretch to say that, you know, this guy can play second or third every day. But 
there's there's enough internal competition now that you can see a situation like this. Espinal was 2022 first half. He was an all star. He was fantastic, but he hasn't produced anywhere near that since. And there's enough internal competition. There's enough guys in the mix now that if some veteran guys aren't good, then there's a pretty good chance that there's going to be somebody in triple A, maybe somebody who starts off in double A who can come up halfway through the season. Clement was the one that stood out for me. Of course, last season, there was David Schneider who came up in August. And when we did the podcast, we were joking, oh, there's no way that some random guy from triple A is going to come up and change the season. And then he had that huge series in Boston and it just completely changed the vibe. So I, I, I do feel better about the position players this year. I think where I'm actually more nervous this year is and this is probably because they had such a good bill of health last year it doesn't seem like something that necessarily happens every single season or something you can bank on happening again the pitching staff there's already been these injuries there's you know alec manoa won't be there for opening day kevin gosman hasn't made a grapefruit league start yet two of the relievers romano swanson they might not be ready for opening day there's kind of a worry on that part about it looks like the offense is going to be better this year but i do worry that the pitching is not necessarily going to be the same that it was last season yeah, I mean, like Manoa aside, as much as you want to assign that as an injury they dealt with last year, they were remarkably healthy. And that is something that is obviously never guaranteed. And we're seeing that uh, right now with the Kevin Gosman stuff, as you touched on, Coombsy. Before we get to the Espinal deal, Andrew, I'll just quickly ask you, are you worried about this pitching staff at all? Or with guys like a Bowden Francis with potentially later down the line a Ricky Tiedemann, do you think they have enough depth to withstand the injuries that are in all likelihood coming this year? Yeah, I mean, I think I am worried about the pitching depth and, and how it's going to be tested. I think, I mean, we just, we don't know because those guys weren't tested last year, but Bowden Francis looked really good. I mean, Tiedemann, I think because of the innings, it's going to be, uh, you know, not necessarily used in the, you know, as a, he's not going to be come in and be Alec Manoa in 2021 and be that starter who comes in and, uh, and can pitch for them all season long. Like he just, that that's just not realistic in terms of like where his arm has built up in his career, but he can come in and help you a few starts if you need it, I think. And, and, uh, and, you know, down in the, the back half of the year can probably become a, a weapon of the bullpen kind of guy uh, as he builds towards next year and really, you know, taking a starter spot um, down the line. But yeah, I, th I think that, I think that that's an issue, but I do think that I'm kind of intrigued by some of their depth too. You know, Francis has looked good. Wes Parsons, you know, there's, there's a guy on Twitter. I don't even, I, I don't know the formulas, but he's, he tweets out, uh, you know, the stuff report every day. And then the, the West Parsons got a lot of those yellow boxes. Like he's looked pretty good. Um, you know, pa uh, Paolo Spino has been good. Um, it had a really nice spring. I don't know how much you know, we can expect out of him. Um, but you go down the line and, and uh, you know, Adam Mako, you know, we saw him a little bit. We saw him getting knocked around, I think, in the, in the spring breakout game. But, um, yeah, there are some guys there that I think that could probably, like, realistically help them. Uh, and, and as long as, you know, three or four of the guys who you expect to be in the rotation are there, it should be, it should be fine. But uh, this is definitely, I think, an expected thing. I mean, I think anybody looked at, you know, the health that they had last year. Uh, it's just not repeatable, right? So, um we shall see. Uh, it would be nice if Alec Manoa got, you know, not just healthy, but back to where he needs to be. Uh, that would make a huge difference. But uh, uh, it's looking tough right now for uh, for him on that front. And yet, I don't know, you go into the first series with uh, with Barrios and Bassett and Kikuchi and, and Bowden Francis. I don't even I don't feel that terrible about that. No, yeah, it's, it is wild just with all the drama and how it's clouded our view of him. <laughs> a year ago, we're talking about Alec Manoa, like, who is this a Cy Young year coming? Like, if yeah. he takes another step forward and just the way it totally fell off a cliff, it, it again, they were remarkably healthy, but losing that guy w was huge. And they are, to an extent, luck's not a great word for it, but they are lucky that they got the bounce back they did from Kikuchi last year, the bounce back they did from Barrios, because you kind of start to think like, oh man, if Manoa would have fallen off a cliff and both of those guys wouldn't have bounced back the way they did. They would have probably been in a lot of trouble last season. Uh, I want to switch gears, go into the Santiago Espinal trade. They flip him over to Cincinnati. Coombsy, you talked about Ernie Clement's spring and even the back half of last year when he came up last year is something that kind of made Espinal expendable. And it sort of felt like ever since John Schneider took over that this was going to happen one day. Once Schneider took over, his innings started to decline. And it wasn't surprising when I got the notification saying the Jays were moving on from him. Um, they go, they get a pitcher who his numbers are mediocre in the minors. Uh, Andrew, what'd you make of the deal? What'd you make of them selling off Espinal at this point? Yeah, I mean, it was a, I mean, I guess they got an asset back, but maybe they could have used that, you know, $2.7 million or whatever it was. Uh, 
had they just non-tendered him at the start of the winter, maybe that would have had like given them an opportunity to to do something else on the free agent market or, or the trade market or, or use that money in a better way. Uh, but yeah, I think you're right. Like, I mean, he was not like nothing against Espinal. Uh, he did, you know, the numbers, the defensive metrics didn't like him as much last year. He didn't hit last year. Uh, it's only in September, I think, was actually not so bad. Um, but yeah, he definitely did feel expendable and felt like the guy who. Uh, was really kind of getting pushed off the roster, and uh, you know, I, uh, I wish him the best. Is really, is really it? Like, he, it was, a, it was great, and he was. I think he can still be a really productive guy for Cincinnati. Um, that's more of a, a spot. I think there's a lot of Blue Jays who are like, oh, well, they, should, they, should, if they were on an NL Central team, they'd get a lot more opportunities. And it's just such a jam-packed roster here with, uh, with guys fighting for those spots, especially when you bring in an Isaiah Connor Falefa. Uh, that that yeah, makes it really <laughs> tough for him, you know. Um, so. Oh, yeah, I like the guy they got back. I don't know. I don't know if it was as much about him. I'm sure they like him, but yeah, I think it was also probably getting all that money off the books because they already committed it when they uh, when they tendered him a contract. They could have given another 2.6 to IKF this winter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, Coomzy, what'd you make of the trade? Yeah, I mean, you look around and you see all the guys who are signing like small money contracts. I think Gio Urshela got what, like two or three million dollars or something like that. Michael Lorenzen, the pitcher, just signed a contract recently with the Texas Rangers for like four or five mils. It would have made some sense, I guess, like like you just said, if if they had just kind of moved on earlier in the offseason and had more cash for free agency. But I guess the positive thing here is and we're kind of reaching for a very Ross Atkins Blue Jays positive, which is this opens up some space for them to make moves at the trade deadline. And <laughs> Ross Atkins yeah, is the kind of GM who talks in the wintertime about what he's going to get up to, not specifically, but like what, what he's going to do at the trade deadline. He had quotes earlier in the winter where he talked about how they have flexibility for moves in July. They made a handful of moves last year. I don't know if it was a great trade deadline last year. It was fine. They kind of raised the floor of the team. The Jordan Hicks edition was good. Genesis Cabrera was good. Paul DeYoung, of course, was a mess. And everybody was 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 asking for that big right-handed bat. They didn't really get it. But I guess the positive thing is a little bit more flexibility there. The pitcher they got back, Chris McElvain, was an eighth-round pick in 2022. So he's not really anywhere near having to be added to the 40-man roster. So... Uh, along with getting, I don't want to say getting rid of Espinal because I don't think he's so bad that you're talking about getting rid of this guy, but they did ultimately have to open up a 40-man spot. Danny Jansen's injured. They got to add one of the catchers. Brian Servan, I think, will be the guy who it winds up being. He's already mashed three or four bombs this year in spring training, so third string catcher that's really exciting um honestly this this this, yeah, this this is where we're at this is the stuff we had to talk about on <laughs> late march spring training um the espinal trade always did always did feel inevitable though it, it is i i did expect to see it earlier in the off season yeah and i honestly kind of did too just again david schneider Kevin biggio like there's enough depth in the minors from last season it, it would have made sense to even like you said andrew potentially not tender him uh let's move along to maybe a bit of a bigger picture thing but again another winter of stadium up upgrades at the rogers center and i know shapiro said that new revenue streams from the upgraded stadium are going to quote what do you say will better support the blue jays payroll so as you go to pay for a beer that last year was 13 dollars and next year is six like you know you can live with the comfort that the blue jays promised to spend that in ways that'll make you happy um but he also then talked about contract extensions for Bo, Bo and vlad and said that they're ongoing andrew do you have any hope that they're going to pony up the money to keep both of those guys blue jays in the long term or do you think it's a one or the other situation yeah i honest i mean it's just it's so hard to like to value vlad that i don't know what like what they would even be ongoing talks about like how do you how do you put a number on what he is because he's just you there, there's what you think he can be and what i'm sure i think he thinks he can be and should be making and what he has been in terms of production it was a one more player last year which a lot of that was was the defense erased it because his, his defense was very poor but like I, like I, I just don't know how you could agree on a number with his camp because I'm sure they think uh, much more highly of him than has been the reality so far, and yet, understandably so. There's all that you know. There, there's all that potential in there still. Um, so he wants to get. I'm sure he wants to get paid like one of the best players in the league, and he just hasn't been that. So I think uh, so. That's just tough to begin with. Bo, uh, you know, maybe he wants to hit free agency. Maybe he, maybe he wants to test in the, the market and see. What, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's a matter of they want to pony up or not. Um, I, I think they should. I think it would be smart. I think that you know this. If these guys go away, the franchise looks 
uh, not in great shape, and it looks like you know we're going into another rebuild, like already, which feels already like it Ooh. feels like we we just got out of one. Um, but like, yeah, and, and Jafar was talking about you know our, uh, like the the junctures. I think he was, he was talking about this week about the. Uh, uh, you know, there's the free agent period, there's the, the the trade deadline, and then they'll sort of have time to assess next year, which means they like next winter, like they could realistically, they could pivot. There could be like a, a, a downward turn, which is going to be a tough pill to swallow if you're uh, paying however much for those beers and for those seats. And uh, I don't, I, you know, uh, I, I, that's a tough ask. But also you just look at where the roster is going. You look at the ages of the guys who aren't Bo and Vlad. And if Bo and Vlad aren't in the, in the future plans, um, it's it's tough to make a go of it, I think, with that roster, and then with what little is coming at the at this point. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think they should just pony up. I think they got to think maybe have to get uncomfortable with with the number with Bo in particular because he's the one you can actually value. But I don't think it's impossible that they could, you know, look, look at where looking at where their payroll is, looking at what they probably are projecting in terms of like what they can bring in, like you say, with the stadium re- renovations. Like, I think they should be able to comfortably fit those guys in, especially as you know. George Springer eventually comes off the books and Gosman comes off the books and Bassett's only, I think, a three-year contract. And uh, there's there's room for, for two players like that. So they should be able to get it done. They have a, a billionaire owner who's, you know, ready to pony up for Otani. So um, not really an excuse. And uh, and if it's, you know, saving a few bucks on Bo versus going into a few your reset mode, like, I don't think the choice is particularly difficult for me, but I'm not the one, you know, with the purse strings. We kind of talked about that even at the end of last season. And then as it went through the off season, it kind of became a bit more clear. But the idea that they're giving this group one more run. And like you said, Andrew, they have decisions to make next coming winter. If this group doesn't come through for them this year, if it isn't a big year from Vlad, if they don't have playoff success with, you know, maybe Bo really establishing establishing himself as like that face of the franchise guy. I think they're thinking this roster will maybe make their decision for them with the way they play this year. And they're making one final bet on this group without going out and, you know, going and signing a Bellinger or whatever it could have been in the winter. But what do you make of that idea, Coombsy, of it's it's giving this group one last chance to show they can do it and find playoff success? Yeah, there's no doubt that they have to at least try this one more time. I think it would be really hard to go into a season let's say hypothetically 2024 winds up being something similar to one of the last two years you know you have a limp dick playoff exit against minnesota you blow a lead against seattle and just you know kind of a toronto maple leafs result and let's say that kind of thing happens again (laughs) and you don't want to go into a season where bow and vlad are in their walk years in 2025 or in 2025 and then you're going and this is happening potentially four times in a row and they can leave after that with all you getting, of course, as the draft pick. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to lean fully into the Cleveland crew narrative where it's like, oh, these guys aren't going to hand out a big contract because they're from Cleveland and they're cheap. But at the end of the day, like, it has to make sense. And if 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 the team hasn't done anything in the five or six years in the Bowen Vlad era, then it becomes harder to justify, you know, going all in with them being your core for the next decade or whatever. Because the reality is with the Blue Jays is if, if things do go south this winter, then they can put themselves in a good position to rebuild quickly and more efficiently probably than you know if they just waited until Bo and Vlad were free agents just got themselves the draft pick they it it sucks to talk this way because you know it's March and the team's got a ton of potential they haven't been anywhere near as good as they could have been but I I don't want to view it as like a negative like a conspiracy thing Cleveland crew thing I think they've 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 designed the roster and the contracts the way things are kind of put together in a way that if things don't work out then they can put themselves in a favorable position to rebuild quickly because it would really suck to have you know all of these renovations all of these like Tyler says more expensive drinks luxury this people are going to go and be spending a million dollars on a beer no one's going to be doing that in 2026 27 28 29 if it's this long long ass drawn out rebuild because you know they were afraid to pick a lane and i think after this season they're gonna have to pick one or the other it's it, it, i i i i have a hard time envisioning them going both Bo and vlad into their walk years without an extension you have to feel that one of them gets it especially if this year is good but if this year is bad then i think everything's off the table i think anything can happen and that's the situation they put themselves into 
Yeah, it's it's tough. Like, man, it's, you don't want to think like this, like you say, but like you can get some pretty good prospects and things coming back your way for Bo and for Vlad with a year, even with just a year left. You can get some good stuff for Kevin Gosman, for George Springer, if he has another good year. You know, there are assets that are movable that could really bring a bounty that could really help you, you know, re- supercharge that rebuild. Oh my God, who even wants to think that way? Like this is a team that should be in the World Series and not be talking about that at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just so weird again, like to think about our mindset a year ago where it's like they are a World Series contender. What a year this is going to be. And we're sitting here however many days before opening day being like, boy, I wonder if we're going to get a rebuild right away. Like, no, that's not what this time of year is about. Um, all right, let's move along and talk about some outside of Toronto stuff. Go around baseball a little bit. It's the biggest story right now. It's the Shohei Otani thing. And just reading a little bit, because quite honestly, I'm a bit confused about what is true and what isn't true with this whole thing. And part of it is confusion coming out of Otani's camp. So I want to read something from ESPN's Tisha Thompson, who said initially a spokesperson, and this was from a couple days ago, but initially a spokesman for Otani told ESPN the funds had been transferred over to cover for his interpreter's gambling debt. The spokesman presented Mizuhara to ESPN for a 90 minute interview. And then before they were going to publish the story, the spokesperson disavowed Mizuhara's account and said Otani's lawyers would issue a statement. So now there's like backtracking going on and all of this stuff while Otani's playing in the opening games out in Seoul as well. Like this is flat out a terrible look for baseball that this story is coming out when it is the fact it's coming out at all. Like, Again, we don't know the facts, so it's hard to be definitive almost when talking about this. But regardless of what the truth is, Andrew, this is a black eye on the sport for the moment. It's tough, yeah, and I think they're trying their best to to avoid it. I mean, you know, we've all we, – I don't know if anybody asked, but we've all, we're, we're all good with gambling responsibly, right? But yeah. in California, it's not legal. So he was going through an illegal bookmaker. That, that there's the, Whoever was making those bets, and you know, there, there's definitely – uh, potentially, or the, it, looks, it looks like there is a crime of some sort in basically any way you slice this. Uh, I guess that's sort of the bottom line. And, uh, you know, I, MLB seems to be, I think that's what's maybe going to make an even worse black eye is how the league responds to this. And, and, you know, like, are they going to even investigate as much as they should because of how high profile this is? And we haven't seen really uh, much of a response, I don't think, from the league so far. Um, because what does the does the response mean putting Shohei Otani on like administrative leave while they figure out what was going on or something like that? I mean, like that would be I understand why they would be reticent to do that, but that's sort of that's the stakes that I think we're kind of talking about here, right? Like that's the that's the scale of this uh situation. Like it's it's uh gambling and baseball, there is a there's a bit of a history there. Uh <laughs> and uh and you know, they are having to tread very lightly, understandably, but also you know, I mean, I think most of us are like, oh, like, who honestly cares? I mean, obviously it was not responsible gambling. It obviously was not done in a legal way. But, um, you know, it doesn't feel like a big deal, except that, you know, the, the cops are involved. And there are, there are <laughs> like there are real crimes that seem to have happened here. So, you know, uh, it's a weird situation. It's uh, it's <laughs> it's it's not it's funny, but it's not funny. I don't know. Um, I hope whoever, you know, whoever has been gotten that far into a bookie, uh, gets the help they need, I guess is, is the best way to put it. Yeah. I mean, there's that too. Um, (laughs) it'll be interesting to see if this just eventually maybe starts going away, but once it's made itself into the public eye, the way it's had cam, it's hard to imagine this story just fizzling out at some point. Yeah, this is this is really kind of caught the attention. Like if you spent any time on Twitter yesterday, it was like every single meme was something about like, oh, this is his interpreter's phone with, you know, 12 different gambling icons. And, you know, it was just the nonstop joke. And this is going to kind of remain in the lexicon. I think it was you, Stoughton, that said, was it you that said sarcastically, you were like the Blue Jays dodged a bullet here. by not <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing that was funny. <laughs> and it's like it's it's just you, you have all this momentum for the Dodgers and the pod is playing their game in Korea and there's so much fanfare it's so fun and and then this comes out and takes the attention and 
it's an awkward one because I mean, our, our podcast is sponsored by Botano. Like we, this is, this is a big thing in the industry now and it's kind of just a reality. And Tyler and I were talking about this in the office yesterday and it's like, you know, all these guys are around this stuff all the time. It's a big part of the sport. Like these are very competitive people who are on all the time during the season. And then the off season rolls around and it's like, you have to switch that competitive thing off. And I don't know, I feel like this is going to be kind of a problem, maybe not uh, just a thing, a narrative. And you have to wonder, like, is, is, are they going to, are the leagues going to have to figure something out with the companies where it's like, all right, like maybe there's an official company where players in a league can make their bets and it's ensuring that they're only betting on different leagues. Because at the end of the day, like, why would I care if a baseball player is betting on football? I can understand that, you know, you're worried about a baseball player betting on a baseball game and changing the outcomes of the game. But if they want to do this thing in their free time and it's not about anything they have control over, then it shouldn't hypothetically really matter. But this is going to be this. This isn't just the beginning and the end of this. Like there are going to be a lot of stories like this over the next few years, I think. And, and people have to start talking about what the tangible solutions are rather than just having, you know, this be drama once every few months. Well, and the, th- the thing is too, yeah. If you're doing it through, you know, a proper company, uh, that's one thing, but if you're doing it through a <laughs> legal bookmaker and you're into him for millions and do- millions of dollars, then there are questions about, mm-hmm. you know, what now are you, are you feeding him? In, can you feed him inside information to help, uh, you know, to help, fix your debt or is there, or can, there are all sorts of yeah. like nefarious things that can happen because there's no reg- regulation no oversight over what you know joe bookie is up to yeah. um so that complicates it i think you know it, it would be it would be different if he was just you know placing bets with one of the many you know like legal operators out there yeah like i mean i think about the calvin ridley thing in the nfl and that was kind of the first big one when they suspended him for a year but he was using a regulated sports book they were able to pinpoint yes it's him these were the games he was betting on while he was injured boom it was cut and dry and what makes this story with otani a lot tougher to dissect is just the fact that like you said offshore illegal unregulated whatever word you want to describe it for the bookie there, there's no way to track this we don't know what's going on and even if the you know authorities are involved you probably won't be able to figure out what was going on unless Otani offers up some proof himself. Uh, okay, we have gone very long, but there's one more area I want to hit on. A couple of the free agent signings from around baseball. The Mets signed J.D. Martinez, one year, $12 million. If I gave you a magic genie wish, Andrew, to swap this deal for, say, the Justin Turner deal, would you do it? <laughs> Yeah, probably. I, I I like Justin Turner. I think you know. I think they like the the leadership stuff. I think they probably are a little bit skeptical of some of the strikeout numbers on Martinez. But um, I don't know if you just look at the the straight up numbers last year. Even as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, Turner played through a foot injury, tanked his numbers a little bit. Uh, so the WRC plus and OPS plus stuff doesn't look quite the same. The number of home runs is not is not there. But it's just yeah. I think Martinez had a better year as a younger player, and and this is a cheaper deal. And so I think yeah, you take. You'd switch that if you could. And uh, Coombsy, I want to get your thought on the Blake Snell deal. What do you make of what the Giants have done here? Just basically sitting back and then nabbing both Chapman and Snell to relative to what we were thinking at the beginning of the offseason bargain deals. This was the yeah, this this was the when I talk about the Blue Jays fans and expectations, I think this is what we all many of us told ourselves that 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 the Jays were going to do or that they were doing. Atkins was playing, you know, a 3D chess game with there was those three teams everyone was talking about. It was the Cubs, the Giants and the Blue Jays. Jeff Passan said, I think the Blue Jays are the most desperate of these teams. They're probably going to sign one of those big names, Chapman, Bellinger, whoever it winds up being. And then, of course, they don't wind up signing any of them. And the Giants are the team. I mean, the Cubs re-signed Bellinger at a nice little contract if he does well he'll opt out and then of course the Giants they had a huge offseason signed a whole bunch of guys Jorge Soler Blake Snell they wind up with Josh um, not Josh Donaldson what am I going to say Matt Chapman <laughs> 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 wrong wrong Oakland they had a Blue Jay um, player there completely yeah they, they did what we thought the Blue Jays were going to do and this is this is I guess if you're going to be disappointed in Toronto's offseason then I think Maybe this is the thing to be disappointed about, that at the end of free agency, they weren't able to get somebody on a sweetheart deal that's way deeper than you would have expected early in the offseason. But the positive here, the positive spin I will put on in it is that it's great that all these guys are going to the National League. Like, that's cool that the Giants are getting better and they'll compete with the Dodgers and the NL West will be fun. I'm thrilled that Blake Snell didn't wind up signing with the Yankees. I'm happy that, you know, J.D. Martinez isn't on the Yankees or the Red Sox or something like that. 
So I guess I'm happy that it looks like this offseason, the National League kind of loaded up a bit more than the AL. And I don't know if we can usually say that every winter. So I guess that that that's that's the thumbs up that I'm getting here. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a really good point as well. All right, we said we were going to keep it shorter than this. We went long, but it was a lot of fun. Andrew, thanks for hopping on and uh, doing this, and look forward to having you back in the mix at BJM. Hell yeah, man. Anytime. Glad to do there it. You, there you go. That is a wrap on episode 199 of Blue Jays Nation Radio. As always, presented by Botano, MLB Futures, everything you need for opening day. You can get it at botano.ca, 19+. plus. Please play responsibly. Coomzy, we'll chat again next week. Best wishes. Thanks for tuning in to Blue Jays Nation Radio. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode.